and welcome to TES Live Lessons. I'm Gronya Hallahan and I'm a writer at TES Magazine. We've brought you today to the capital of England, London. We've got an exciting treat for you. We're going to give you an English writing lesson with the famous book publishers Penguin. We've got a real life published author who's going to give you some writing tips. We better go and get started. And this is the really exciting bit. I get to introduce you to our fabulous author. This is Dr. Nazneen Ahmed Patak, and she is here today to talk to you about editing. Nazneen, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Now, I want to hear all about your new book. Please tell us what is it about? So my book is called The City of Stone and Magic, and it is coming out with Puffin Books in June. It's a historical fantasy book which is looking at the journey of my main character takes. She's called Jumper and she's got magic and so has her mother. And her mother is actually abducted by a sinister organisation called The Company and they take her to London and Jumper's got to get her back. So she takes this journey, she travels on a ship that's powered by a tree which has a magical spirit living in it. She comes to London, she makes some friends with magic and she has to challenge this sinister company who are doing terrible things. That story has everything. We've got mystery, we've got intrigue, we've got villains, we've got a nice big journey. I cannot wait to read it. So our lesson today is all about editing. I've got some students who are absolutely dying to ask you some questions. So let's hear from them. Hello, we're your successful Ketcher Park Junior Academy. And my question is, why is editing very important? Editing is how we make a skeleton of a story into a living, breathing thing that readers will really enjoy. What is the most useful feedback you've ever had? The most useful feedback I've ever got is thinking about our first drafts as the placeholders for the right words that are going to come next. This really helps me visualise writing as a process rather than just the act of getting words out onto a page. What is your tips for writing engaging stories? I use a range of things to help the reader feel. So I give my characters distinctive voices so they seem like real people. I focus on atmosphere and I also work to build conflict and tension in the events of my story. What questions do you ask yourself when you finish writing stories? The two things I ask myself when I finish my story are, does the plot work and make sense? and are my characters real and believable? If I'm a good writer, do I still need to read over my work? Everybody needs to read over their work. There's always things we can do to improve a story, and sometimes we don't even realise there's a better way of telling our stories until we start taking them apart and putting them back together again. How many times do you need to read and check a book before it's been published? How long is a piece of string? A book goes through many, many different forms of editing before it comes out and it's read by many different people. So when I first started writing my book, um, my editor was reading it and they were looking at how it worked as a story. Then it was passed to my copy editors who looked at it in terms of whether all the details were true and would work and whether the logic of the story worked. Then it was passed on to the proofreaders who checked the spelling and punctuation. And now it's just about to go to print. <laughs> what is it like to have your work edited? It's quite scary when you get your work edited because it's something that you really care about. But at the same time, it's also a real privilege because you've got all these people in your corner helping you make your story as good as it could possibly could be. So let's have a look at what some of those taking the words out looked like. Could you please read for us a section of your book before it was edited and then after? Absolutely. So this is the original. The East India Dock could barely even be seen due to the thick white fog which seemed to bleach London of what little colour it usually had. Yet Dupu had a sense of massive scale and power which made the Colaba Dock seemed like a playground, too small, 
bright and new in comparison, bedecked as it had been with playful, multicoloured flags. There was no such colour in London. And this is a revised version that will be in the printed book in June. The East India Dock could barely be seen through the thick white fog that bleached London of all colour. The boys stood on the edge of the deck, their packs strapped tightly to their chests, their thin cotton uniforms flapping in the wind. Tipu stared down into the black water and gulped. He could tell it was freezing just by looking at it. What differences can you find in those two pieces of writing? You've got two minutes to make some notes. Off you go. Read the two versions of the story and look at what has changed. Try and find three things that are different between the old and new version. There might be words missing or new words added. Here is a hint. Start by circling the full stops and counting them. What do you notice? We're now going to hear some ideas from some students about what differences they found in the writing. She's taken the long sentence and she split it in two to make it shorter. Tipu comes later in the new version. The word do is changed to free. OK, now let's try weaving some of that magic with our, our text now. So I'm just going to read out to you what we have at the moment. It says, a figure stood in the shadows watching the other children. The children were playing football and shouting and cheering. The girl had thick glasses. She had a small face with lots of dark unruly hair that stuck up. She wore a red school dress that was striped when it should have been checked. I hate football, she said. Now in your classrooms, you're either going to work on this same piece of text or you can use some of your own writing that you've done. Where should we begin? When you look at this piece of writing or any piece of writing, what is the best thing to start with when you're beginning the editing process? I like to start with structure. And with this big chunk of text, I think about splitting it up into shorter paragraphs. It makes it easier to read, it's nicer for the reader and it's nicer for the writer because then you can get more of an idea of where your ideas have been and where they're going to go next. So, a handy way that I remember to paragraph is tip top. So your paragraph should always be tip top. And by that I mean time. When the time changes, you've got to start a new paragraph. You've got to flash forward, flash back, you've gone from morning to the evening, new paragraph. When the place changes, if you move from one location to another, new paragraph. If the topic changes, so if you move from talking about one aspect of your story to a new aspect, you're going to need a new paragraph. 
And then finally, the one that I think is the easiest to forget as soon as you have a person speaking, new paragraph. So, looking at this here, what number of paragraphs do you think we could divide this up into? Let's try three. Three is a good number. Okay, you've got two minutes now, so if you're working with this piece of writing, see if you can divide it into three paragraphs. If you've got your own piece of writing, look at how you've paragraphed it so far and use that tip top to decide if it needs some paragraphs in there. Read through the text and think about the tip top rules. Divide it into three paragraphs using the double forward slash sign to show where the new paragraph should go. Okay, let's look at it now. That's much better. Oh, it's immediately easier to read, isn't it? Okay, there's some other things we need to look at here as well. So we've got a few grammatical mistakes and I always think they're important to correct. Absolutely, because grammar isn't just about it being right. When we have errors in grammar, that affects the reader's enjoyment of the story and that's what's most important to us as writers. Oh completely, we've always got to think about the reader experience and as soon as you reach a, a grammatical mistake as a reader, it just jolts you out of the story, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. So, in this piece of writing, I know that there's a mistake with of and have and I think I spotted it as soon as I read it out loud, which is often when we spot these sorts of mistakes. Another common mistake to make is with a there, there, there. So you've got there as in their belongings, there as in, oh, it's over there, and therefore they are. Other mistakes you sometimes make might be the was, were confusion, and it's always I, was, we, were. So thinking about those types of grammatical errors or perhaps some other ones that you know that you, you tend to make, Look at your piece of writing and see if you can spot the of have mistake in this one or any other errors that you might have made in your own writing. We're going to give you one minute for that. Off you go. Read through the text again, looking for the mistake mixing up of and have. Rewrite the sentence using the correct word. If you're using your own work, rewrite any sentences you find with grammatical errors.
Okay, so now we've got a much better sentence and it says, when it should have been checked, talking about her dress. And I hope that you spotted that one too. Right, now, vague language. This is so tricky when you read over your own work because of course we know what we mean, but when a reader reads it, it can get a bit confusing. And I think here it is quite confusing when we're talking about this figure because in the second paragraph, it's not necessarily clear that that figure is, you know, the little girl. I think that needs a little bit of, of rewriting. Have a look at that sentence and see if you can rewrite it to make it clear that the figure is the young girl. Do you think that would make it better? I think that would make it much clearer. Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes to really think about that. And if you're working with your own piece of work, read through it and try and pretend that you're somebody else who's meeting this text for the first time and see if you can spot any vague language in what you've written. Rewrite the sentence, the girl had thick glasses. So it is clear to the reader that the girl with the glasses is the same person as the figure in the shadows. If you're using your own work, rewrite a sentence so the reader is more clear about what is happening. Now let's go to our class and see what they've done. This is my version of the sentence. The girl who was watching through the shadows had thick glasses on. A figure in the shadows was, the, was a lovely little girl. This is my version. A figure had thick glasses. This is my version of the sentence. She moved forward and became recognised as a girl with thick glasses peering. Well, hopefully now your piece of writing sounds much more clearer and the person who's reading it can follow the action of what's happening. Next, we're going to talk about full stops. Nazneen, tell me, full stops, how do you approach them when you're writing? Well, I think a really good tip for any writing is to read it out loud mm. because full stops are the natural points where we stop and take a breath. And if we don't have those in a piece of writing, we are actually suffocating <laughs> as readers. <laughs> we're not just helping improving your writing here, we're saving your lives. <laughs> so let's think about this piece. We've got, looking at particular, that, that second paragraph, the children were playing football and shouting and cheering. The girl had thick glasses, full stop. She had a small face with lots of dark unruly hair that stuck up, full stop. She wore a red school dress that was striped when it should have been checked, full stop. And then we have that I hate football. Yeah. So here, I definitely think we could do with some more full stops. I mean, they could be broken up a little bit, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. And I think the other thing to think about is the fact that we've got 
she repeated twice and that's not very nice no. either. It starts to sound like a long list and it's not very interesting for a reader. The whole point of a story is to draw somebody in to get lost in the action and by jolting them out with that kind of clumsy phrasing, it doesn't work. So we're going to give you three minutes now because this is quite tricky to look at where the full stops are, see if you can add some more in and think about the words that you start your new sentence with to see if we can avoid this she repetition. If you're working with your own work, count your number of full stops, put circles around all of them, read it out loud like Nazanin said, and think about where your full stops really need to go. Off you go. First, circle all the full stops in the text or in your own work if you're using your own writing. Then, Rewrite these three sentences so they become five or six sentences and vary their sentence openings. If you're using your own work, pick a long sentence you think would be better as two or three sentences and vary the sentence openings. Now let's see what some of the students said. My description of the girl is, Millie had a tiny face like a pea with lots of brown scruffy hair that stuck out like straw. She wore a red school dress that wasn't striped instead of check checked and had a muddy stench. My description of the girl is, Anne had a small face with lots of dark unruly hair that stood tall like the Statue of Liberty. She wore a red school, that, school dress that was striped when it should have been boldly checked. The girl had a small face with lots of dark unruly hair that stuck up. She wore a red school dress. It was striped, but it should have been checked. The dress was old with thread sticking out of the lining. OK, I feel like this is coming along nicely now. I think what this piece is lacking is a little bit of 
vivid imagery. And one way to do that is with some sensory language. So when we talk about sensory language, what do we mean by the senses? We're talking about how a character feels in a scene. So everything that they will be experiencing in terms of sight, smell, touch, hearing, what they're hearing. We want to channel all of that in our writing. And this extract, if you're working with this one, it's great because we've got the figure in the shadows and then the contrast with the children playing out on the field. So you've got a lot to do with that, haven't you? There's a lot you can play with. And then if you're using your own work, think about the scene that you've chosen. What senses could you possibly have that you could put in there? And one way you can include sensory language is, of course, similes. Should we just remind ourselves of what similes are? A simile is when you make a comparison using like or as. So let's have a think about the sentence, their shouts and cheers carried on the breeze. Okay, how about their shouts and cheers carried on the breeze like a twisting rope? That's okay, but it doesn't really give us a sense of how the shouts and cheers carried, how they moved. No, no, it doesn't really. Twisting rope. Carried on the breeze. No, there's no connection there, is there? No. Right, I can do this. I'm going to try again. The shouts and cheers carried on the breeze like leaves drifting down a valley. That's so much better. Right, now it's your turn. You can either use that same sentence, pick a different one, and if you've got your own piece of writing, choose one from there. You've got three minutes to insert a simile with some sensory imagery in it. Off you go. Rewrite a sentence to include a simile using sensory language. That is language that refers to sight, smell, taste, touch or sound. OK, we'd love to hear what you've done. Let's hear from some of the students. This is my simile. The wind howled loudly like a wolf. 
massively is the girl's blood started to boil like a kettle steaming with anger and frustration. Right, I think now's the time to make our children write a little bit more. We need another paragraph to be added in here. And I think a nice thing to do in your writing is just to zoom in onto one small detail. And I think that would work here, wouldn't it? I think it would really help. And one idea you might want to use is this figure that we have of the in the shadows and the girl. Perhaps you might want to include like a parallel, like a mirror image version of this girl who's perhaps somebody that she's spotted in the distance and she sees them. And this person that you're describing could be their opposite or someone that she identifies with, or you know, something, something that links the two of them together. That that would work nicely. Maybe something like as she stared into the distance. The little girl found herself staring at one child in particular. This little boy wasn't playing football with the other children. Instead, he was standing like her, off to one side. Then, all of a sudden, fireworks seemed to explode beneath him. His arms were thrown up to the sky and he was cheering and laughing and whooping and yelling. A goal had been scored. His joy was completely unbridled, totally carefree. So here, I've tried really hard to vary the length of the sentences and change the number of syllables in each one. Yes, and that's made so much difference because that list, those shorter sentences, they give that variety and it makes it much more enjoyable for a reader. So see if you can try that with your own work. If you're including a paragraph in the text that we've given you, brilliant. You might want to choose a child who might want to zoom in on a different object. And if you've got your own piece of writing, read through it again. Pick something that you could zoom in on and write a new paragraph, thinking about the length of your sentences. We're going to give you four minutes to do this one because it's quite a bit longer. Off you go. Write three sentences for a new paragraph where you zoom in on one detail. If you're working from the extract above, this might be something in the field or an item of clothing the girl is wearing. If you're working on your own piece of writing, choose your own detail to zoom in on.
Now our students have been working very hard in the classroom. Let's hear some of their ideas. This is my zoomed in paragraph. As she looks over, she saw a little yellow flower of happiness waving about like it was cheering for the children playing football. It was pure joy. As she looked down, she noticed a flower. It was purple. The colour reminded her of Jessie, her dog. Excellent work, everyone. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but it's been absolutely fantastic having you here with us, Nazine. So thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you so much. It's been really fun, and I've loved sharing some editing tips with you. So remember, my favourite tip is to read your work out loud. But what three other things will you take home for your editing today? In my work, I can use more similes. I'm going to remember to use TikTok while writing paragraphs. I'm going to try rereading my paragraphs more in my work. We'd both absolutely love to see your work. We really would. So ask your teachers to upload it onto social media. You can use the hashtag TezLiveLessons and at us at Tez4Teachers. And also, if you want to see more lessons like this, hit the subscribe button and subscribe to our channel. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.